بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلاما على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكيا واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد when we started off this lecture series in the very first lecture in the opening words that i said i mentioned that the beauty of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was very unique and it was unique in the sense that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was beautiful in every aspect not only in one aspect but in all aspects and at that time i had mentioned that the human being is composed of two things the khalq and the khulq the outer shell of the human being and the character or the soul that lies within the human being so two aspects the outer and the inner and we talked about the outer beauty of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam how beautiful the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was outwardly but at the same time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was as beautiful if not more beautiful inwardly the character of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was extremely beautiful and in reality if we look at the people around us the people who we choose as friends the people who we like being with as human beings as insan we love socializing in arabi the human being is called al insan and the reason why the human being is called al insan is because the word al insan is taken from another word and the scholars they differ in opinion in what is that other word some scholars say the word al insan is taken from the arabic word nasiya which means to forget and adam alayhi salam he forgot that's why the human being is called al insan Some scholars say the word al-insan is taken from the Arabic word al-uns. And al-uns means to socialize, to be with people. And the human being by nature he must create friends and loves to socialize. The people that we choose to socialize with, the interesting thing is that very rarely very very rarely and I haven't seen anyone in my lifetime anyway, maybe you guys have seen someone but I leave a little possibility of someone like this may exist. Very rarely do we choose our friends based off their looks. Maybe a spouse, but someone that you sit with, someone that you play ball with, someone that you chill with, someone you go out to eat with, very very rarely do we ever choose someone based off their looks. It's always based off something else about that person. There's something different about that person, something we like about them. And usually it's a characteristic. It's some characteristic, some character they have, some khulq they have. and those characteristics now sometimes something within them that we see in reality it's bad we like that and then we choose that person as our friend and at times we see their good characteristics and we choose good friends the people that have the best characteristics are those who the world loves to be with if there is one person who walks inside you know this room right here for the brothers or the sister and that sister is known for having good character someone who doesn't get angry someone who's modest someone who's focused someone who's always asking about people smiling talking nicely to people giving their attention to that person automatically the word spreads that that person's a good person and everyone wants to be close to that person and even if that person isn't your friend at least in your mind you know that man i wish i can be like that person and you make dua to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala oh allah allow me to be like that person and i've seen many people like this within chicago i i can name many people that their character is such that wherever i go in the state anyone that knows them they only speak good of those people it's because of their character and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had the best character his character was so great that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised the character of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to be praised by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a very big thing because allah and the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam do not exaggerate exaggerating is something we human beings do then when we don't know the reality of something and we see a shade of it so then we assume that this person is so good in this aspect and we exaggerate but for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is no exaggerating for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows every aspect of the human being allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows every single thing about that person and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he praises the character of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now character isn't beautiful a person can't be can't conclude whether a person another individual's character is beautiful based off seeing their character at the time of good true character is seen at the time of difficulty when the when the world crumbles down on you and everyone comes against you and people are harsh and mean to you that's when you see a person's true character 
And there's a very beautiful surah of the Qur'an in the 29th which is Surah Qalam Noon wal qalam wa ma yasturun This is a very beautiful and unique surah and it completely relates to the Muslim in the 21st century. The reason being is because this surah was revealed at the time in which the Prophet ﷺ was being attacked on every possible level by the people of Makkah Mukarramah. Physically, emotionally, they were there to assassinate the character of the Prophet ﷺ. And they made so much fun of the Prophet ﷺ. They bothered the Prophet ﷺ so much. The Prophet ﷺ was in the haram, right outside the Kaaba, right in front of the Kaaba. He was praying salah. And a group of the kuffar were sitting not too far away, the mushrikeen. And they said that he's there praying alone and there's no one there to defend him. Let's play a joke on him. So one of these people, he picked up the fetus of a dead animal and he took it and he placed it on the back of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ had so much weight on his back that he couldn't lift himself from the sajda. And everyone was laughing and mocking and making a joke out of the Prophet ﷺ. Until one of the people went and they told the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, Fatima radiallahu anha, according to some narrations and other narrations, suggest other names, that they told the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, that your father is being made a mock of inside the masjid right now. And he's in sajda and he can't push himself up because of the, the, the weight they put on his back. So she came to the masjid and she removed this from the back of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ finished his salah and he saw Fatima was sitting on the side crying. The Prophet ﷺ asked her, why are you crying? She said, oh, Messenger of Allah, they're making a joke out of you. And the Prophet ﷺ, he hugged her and he cried. And he said to her, Fatima, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us for our patience. This is when you see a person's true character. When the person is going through the toughest time. And they said to the Prophet ﷺ, as Surah Qalam tells us, they said, oh, they said, oh Messenger, oh Muhammad, innaka majnoon, you are innaka la majnoon, you are an insane person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا أَنْتَ بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ بِمَجْنُونَ They may call you insane, but in reality you aren't insane. And the person who was attacking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his name was Walid ibn al-Mughayrah, the father of Khalid ibn Walid. Khalid ibn Walid the Allah one's father. Walid ibn al he was making fun of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very hurt by the words these people were saying. So in order to console the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah azza wa revealed Surah Qalam. And how does this surah start off? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturun. Ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon. Wa innaka la ajran ghayra mamnoon. That they are mocking you, they're making fun of you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will give you a reward which is promised to you. Wa innaka la ala khuluqin adeen. And why is the reward promised for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Because of his great character. His great character. That at the time of difficulty, the Muslims lived in Makkah Mukarramah for 13 years as the Prophet ﷺ was a prophet for 13 years in Makkah Mukarramah. And in these 13 years, these were the most difficult 13 years of the life of the Prophet ﷺ because the attacks didn't happen daily, they happened more or less hourly. Something or the other. Someone was saying something here, someone in the other corner of the masjid was saying something there, someone in Makkah Mukarramah was saying something here. Every dinner there was a talk about the Prophet ﷺ. Like the Prophet ﷺ when Muslims had become a taboo to society and constantly attacking the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ for 13 years, he was not even granted permission by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to defend himself physically. They would attack the Prophet ﷺ, there was no permission to even fight back. If the companions were killed, they were not allowed to fight back. They were told to be patient, patience is your way. The first verse that was revealed that the companions were given permission to even defend themselves was after migration when they arrived in Medina Munawra. One person came to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he got into an argument with him. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud he became upset. So that person, he slapped Abdullah ibn Mas'ud So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud considered retaliating. And that person said, your Lord hasn't given you permission to def defend yourself, you can't hit me back. And then Abdullah ibn Mas'ud came to the Prophet and he said, a Messenger of Allah, these people are attacking us and we can't even defend ourselves. The Prophet made dua to Allah and the verse was revealed. أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the verse that now they are given permission. أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ Those who were attacked, those who were fought with, they have been granted permission now. What? To defend themselves. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ And Allah has all ability for their assistance. Allah will help them. So the Prophet ﷺ had this character. And this character of the Prophet ﷺ is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised him great reward at. The Prophet ﷺ, he said to the companions, as narrated by Imam Bayhaqi, 
He narrates from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Inna ma bu'ithu li utammi ma makarim al akhlaq." That Allah subhanahu wa taala has sent me. I have been sent to you to complete the best of character. You know, people say Islam was spread by the power of the sword. You know, if Islam was spread by the power of the sword, then I have one basic question: People like Khalid bin Walid who dropped the Roman and Persian Empire, people like Saad bin Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu, who is referred to as the Lion of Arabia. People like you know Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah radiyallahu an, who took down the, 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 the Roman Empire. People like Amr ibn As radiyallahu ta'ala an, who took out the, 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 the Egyptian kingdom. You know, there are so many companions, great warriors. If Islam was spread by force, if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forced the companions to accept Islam, I ask, which power in the world had the ability to force someone like Khalid bin Walid to accept Islam? Did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have the physical power to force Umar ibn Khattab to accept Islam? It was nothing to do with force. What these people did was that they just saw the Prophet ﷺ's character and it mellowed their hate down and all of a sudden they fell in love with the Prophet ﷺ. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ says, I was sent to complete the best of character. And I was saying that character can be examined and should be examined at the time of difficulty. That's what the Prophet ﷺ, he said as narrated by Uqba bin Amr radiallahu anhu. Uqba bin Amr radiallahu anhu says, I came to the masjid to visit the Prophet ﷺ. And there was a gathering around the Prophet ﷺ but I had in my heart something that I wanted to ask the Prophet ﷺ that was very important to me. So he said, I cut through the gathering and I sat right in front of the Prophet ﷺ. And Uqba bin Amr says, I held the hand of the Prophet ﷺ immediately. I got a hold of his hand. And in one narration he says, I sat in front of the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ took hold of my hand. And then the Prophet ﷺ said to him, that, Oh Uqba, should I not tell you what is the definition of good character? And he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, please tell me what is the best character? The Prophet ﷺ said, Good character is in three things. The first thing, when someone breaks ties with you, you join ties with that person. You know, today we talk about good character by me saying salam to someone who says salam to me. Or if someone invites me over for dinner, I invite them over in return. You know, when I got married, and for those of you who are married, you can relate to this. Those who, don't get, who aren't married yet, you'll see this soon, inshallah. When, when I got married, my mother said to me, the next day of my marriage, that Hussein, everything that was given to you at the time of marriage as a gift, don't open it up. I said, why? My mother said, because we have to make a list of all the people who gave to you and what they gave you. So I was confused. I said, why would you want a list of all the people who gave me gifts? Okay, I can understand that, but what they gave me? So then I asked, why? So they replied back by saying, because when their turn comes, we have to give them we have to give them the same thing back. So if someone gave you $100 for your marriage, we have to make sure we give that $100 back. And if someone gave you, you know, a kettle that was on sale from Walmart, then make sure we gave that same thing back to them. So our, our, you know, our, our, our relations, our kindness, is based off, you're good to me, I'm good to you. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours in return. The Prophet wasallam he says in hadith, لَيْسَ الْوَاصِرُ بِالْمُكَافِي وَلَكِنَّ الْوَاصِرُ الَّذِي إِذَا قُطِعَتُ رَحِمَهُ وَصَلَهَا The one who joins relation isn't the one who's mukafi. Mukafi means that someone did something to you and you just pay that person back, you're equal. The Prophet says, if you want to see good character, you want to see someone who really has good character, go find someone who slaps you in the face and then go and say sorry to that person. Show, show your character at that time. You know, when someone's done wrong to you and yet you still are nice in return to that person. The Prophet ﷺ said to this companion, Uqba bin Amr radiallahu anh, the second sign of good character, the second thing to examine the best of character, is when someone doesn't give to you. They have a dinner, they invited all their friends, but you were left out. Okay? They gave something out, and every person received something, but you weren't given. They don't give to you. But in return, you give to them. Because your giving isn't based off them giving to you, your, your giving is based off, you are trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whether they give or not, your sincerity lies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, you will always go forward and give. And the third thing, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever harms you, forgive them. If someone does something wrong to you, someone harms you, someone does something bad to you, they write a bad email to you, in return you forgive them. You know, one of the most interesting things that happened, maybe one of the highlights of my year of 2012, I was thinking about the other, year, the other day, that what are the highlights of this year? What are the great things that happened in my life in this year? So, I have to say one of the things that take the win was this week there was a scholar, a very good friend of mine. Many of you may even know him, so I won't say his name. Khair. He sent me an email. And he sent this email to a group of friends, a group of our friends, 
scholars. And he sent this email and he said that one of the people from my local congregation sent this email to me. I want you guys to read it. So when I read the email, it was actually quite interesting because the guy started off by praising the sheikh for like one paragraph and the next following 15 paragraph, he butchered the sheikh. He said, you're this, you're that. Please, for Allah's sake, I ask you for the sake of Allah, don't renew your contract as imam in the masjid and you're, you're this and you're that. And he went off on the sheikh. So I replied back by saying, dear sheikh, why would you forward that email to me? So he said, the reason is because I found that in his harshness, there was sincerity lying there. Within his harshness, he was a little aggressive, a little mad, but if you look inside what he was saying, what he was saying were valid points. The things that he was trying to say were all valid points. And that opened my eyes and I thought to myself, SubhanAllah, someone who's being harsh in return, you're taking advice from that person. There was a very famous scholar from the Indian subcontinent by the name of Sheikh Rashid Ahmad Gangohi. Rahmatullahi alayhi. He was known for standing, against, standing up against bid'ah of his time. All the people who were innovating in the deen, he stood up against them, he wrote books against them, gave lectures against them, very vocal in speaking out against bid'ah. And the people who were against him, they were as vocal in speaking out against him. So, at one point in his life, Shaykh Rashid Ahmad Gangohi rahmatullahi alayhi, became very weak, and he lost his eyesight. So there was a person by the name of Shaykh Yahya, may Allah have mercy on him, who was a father of Shaykh Zakaria Khandalvi, who wrote Fadal Amal, the very famous book, his father, Shaykh Yahya. He used to serve Shaykh Rashid Ahmad Gangohi rahmatullahi alayhi, to help him out, because the man was blind, he would take care of things for him. And one of the things that he would do for his Shaykh was that he used to write the letters and read the letters to his Shaykh. So all the letters that came in the day, he would read them to his Shaykh, and then he would write down their responses and send them out. So one day while he was reading one of the letters, he came to one point where something that was written on the letter was very bad. The person was swearing at the sheikh and his parents, like using bad language. So Sheikh Yahya said that, I was reading the letter and I stopped. And Sheikh Rashid said, continue reading the letter. He said, dear sheikh, the next lines, I can't say them with my tongue in front of my beloved teacher. So Sheikh Rashid Ahmad figured out that maybe there's something bad in there. So he said to him, read it. Because it's possible within that person's vulgar language, there may be some advice for us to take. So beautiful. So easily said for us. But in reality, imagine that. That someone that's really butchering you, coming at you at all speed, and really trying to attack you. And in re- what you, the way you look at it is that you say, no, 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 there is sincerity within this person. And let me see what kind of benefit I can derive from this person's statements. You know, the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us here that good character is actually seen at the time of difficulty. There was from the, from the grandchildren of the Prophet ﷺ, there was one by the name of Imam Zain al-Abideen, rahimahullah ta'ala, rahmatan wasiyah. Imam Zain al-Abideen, rahmatullah was from the children of Hussein radiallahu ta'ala, who was the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. And Imam Zain al-Abideen was actually present with Hussein radiallahu an in Karbala when his, when his grandfather Hussein radiallahu an was killed. He was there that day. The only way he lived that day, how he actually came out of there alive, is because that day on the 10th of Muharram, he was sick. And he was inside the tent with the women and the sick people. So when they attacked Hussein of the Allah Wan's army, when they killed all the companions and his, and his helpers, they came to that tent and they saw the sick people were there and the women were there, so they let them alone. And that's how Imam Zain al-Abideen, rahimahullah ta'ala, rahmatullah wasi'ah, lived. So Imam Zain al-Abideen, rahmatullah ali, had a servant. Now this servant of his once was pouring water for him while he was doing wudu. And the pot fell from the servant's hand and it fell down and it smashed. So now when the pot smashed, first of all, there was a loss because he did, one valuable pot was just broken. And all this water spilled over him. So he was angry there, getting late for salah, even more upset. So he looked up at his servant and he was in rage. So the servants of that time were also smart people. So the servant said, he's in rage. Why not take, benef- why not take some faida, some good benefit from this time? So the servant recited one verse of the Quran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves people with certain characteristics. And one of those characteristics, a servant recited the verse of the Qur'an, وَالْكَاذِمِينَ الْغَيْثِ Allah loves those who control their anger. So Imam Zain al-Abideen rahimahullah ta'ala, when he heard this verse, he lowered his eyes and he controlled his anger. Then the slave said, وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ Which is the next part of the verse. And Allah also loves those who forgive. So he looked up and said, I forgive you. And then the slave recited the last part of the verse, Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen, and Allah loves those who do good in return. So he said, go, you're free, I let you go. You know, they had control over themselves. It's good character. This is what good character is. You know, our good character is only seen in gatherings. It's seen the second we step out of our house. You know, my teacher used to always say, if you want to see how good of a husband a person will make after marriage, see how good he is to his parents before marriage. 
You know, we say thank you and you're welcome to every person that opens a door for us and any person who walks past us and anyone who smiles at us and waves at us and does a little favor for us. But when was the last time that we actually showed this character within the four walls of our house? You know, our mothers and our parents open the doors for us and, and do much more than that on a daily basis. But how often do we actually say to them, thank you, Jazakallah, may Allah reward you. And our wives, they cook for us every day, they clean for us every day, they look after us every day, they share the love with us every day. But what do we do, what do, we do for them in return? You know, those who are newly married, maybe for a few weeks, there's a little, you know, thank you, and you know, blah, blah, blah. But a few weeks after that, it's gone. You know, Ali radiallahu anh, he, he, defi- he described the marriages of his time by saying, Sururu shahrin, kusuru dhahrin, ghumumu dhahrin. He said, the marriages of my time, what are they? Happiness for a month, sururu shahrin, kusuru dhahrin, breaking of the back, and ghumumu dhahrin, a life full of grief and misery. But that, that was the marriage of his time, right? And the reality is that this is what we face today. Good character is something that stays with you at all times. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he had amazing character. For Allah subhanahu wa taala praises character in the Quran. There's a hadith narrated by Imam Bayhaq rahmatullahi alayhi in Shu'ab al-Iman. He narrates from Amr bin Shu'ib an Abihi and Jaddihi. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to the companions, "Should I tell you who will be standing closest to me on the day of judgment? On the day of judgment, all this difficulty, people running around, father and mother, no one is there to help you." You have to deal with the deeds, all the things that you did in the world. The Prophet ﷺ said, do you know who's going to be standing closest to me on the Day of Judgment? The companions, they said, oh, Messenger of Allah, please tell us. The Prophet ﷺ said, the one who has best character. That will be the person who will be standing closest to me on the Day of Judgment. Another hadith narrated by Imam Tirmidhi, rahmatullahi alayhi, he narrates from Abu Huraira radiallahu anh, that a companion, he asked the Prophet ﷺ, oh, Messenger of Allah, please tell us which deed will take most people into Jannah. The people that will be in Jannah, which deed caused most of them to enter into Jannah? The Prophet ﷺ said two things. He said, consciousness of Allah, taqwa. And he said, husn al good character. These are two things that are t- going to take most people into Jannah. And then a companion, he asked the flip of the question. He said, O Messenger of Allah, which thing will take most people to the fire of hell? And the Prophet ﷺ said, that the tongue and that which lies between the thighs the person's private area. That will take this person, th- these are the two things that will take most people to the fire of hell. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us control over these things, inshaAllah, Aziz. Another hadith narrated by, Abu Daw- by Imam Abu Dawood, rahmatullahi alayhi, he narrates from Abu Hurairah radiallahu anh, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his du'as, in his blessed du'as, one thing that he used to seek protection from, you know, we make dua to him, we seek protection from certain things. Oh Allah, save us from the fitna of the Dajjal. Oh Allah, save us from the fitna of this, that, and the other. Oh Allah, save us from poverty. We make duas too. The Prophet wasallam, amongst his duas, he used to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ash-shiqaqi wa nifaqi wa su'il akhlaq. Right? He used to seek protection from Allah. He used to say, Oh Allah, save me from bad character. Save me from bad character. You will never find any narration. And the companions were honest. You won't find any narration that a person came to the Prophet wasallam and he left the gathering because he was upset with the Prophet wasallam. Not even the enemies. Not even those who were non-Muslims. The waft from Najran came. You know, a group of people came from Yemen. They were Christians. They came to debate with the Prophet wasallam, And they put their best debater, Abdul Masih, in front of the Prophet wasallam. And there was a full-fledged debate that took place. If someone wishes to engage in, you know, in your interfaith discussions or... Compared to religion discussions, this is a very important narration. The debate between the Prophet ﷺ and the group of the Christians that came from Najran. The debate that took place there. And this was the cause of Surah Ali Imran being revealed, which is the third surah in the Qur'an. Surah Ali Imran was revealed because of this debate. The Prophet ﷺ was given verses by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to respond to them. إِنَّ مَثَلَ عِيسَىٰ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ آدَمْ خَلَقَهُ مِن تُرَابِ ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ الْحَقُّ مِن رَبِّكَ Allah Azza wa Jal says that, you know, that, that the example of Isa a.s. according to Allah is like Adam a.s. Isa a.s. was born without a father, then Adam a.s. was born without a father and a mother. And these, the verses are there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then at the end when they refused to listen, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa didn't get angry with them. He didn't become angry or frustrated. The Prophet ﷺ kept his cool and he showed his good character even at that time. That's why a group of those people actually accepted Islam. And then later on, later on, Islam went down to Yemen and it went down and it spread it there. This is how the people of Yemen accepted Islam. Now, good character is something that's accepted and humanly we aspire to have good character. But what is good character? What are certain things that we should strive to increase and, and make our character better in? Now this is a very broad discussion. And there are so many things that we should work on, so many things that we should work on, that if I try to cover them all in one lecture, 
or even in a lecture series, I would probably fail to do so because there are so many aspects of the human being's life that we need to work on good character. But below I have listed a list of things, a few, maybe five, six things that maybe we should work on developing our character in. Good character starts with what we call ikhlas. The top thing, the first thing you want to work on your character is sincerity. Imam Qurtubi rahmatullahi alayhi, who was a famous uh, Undulusi, uh, the Spaniard scholar who worked on the tafsir. His tafsir is one of the most accepted tafsirs across the world. You know, in any bookstore that you see, Imam Qurtubi rahmatullahi alayhi's Ahkam al-Quran is sold there. It's a very famous book. Imam Qurtubi rahmatullahi alayhi in his tafsir, underneath the word ikhlas, he defines by saying that he says, Al-ikhlasu min amal al-qalb wa huwa alladhi yuradu bihi wajhu Allah la ghayrahu. He says that sincerity is actually related to the heart. It's to do with the heart. Sincerity, working on your sincerity is something that no one can do other than you. If you have a bruise here, you can go to the doctor, he can help you work on it. If you have a broken bone, you can go to someone, they can help you work on it. You're not looking clean, you go to the barber, he'll help you look clean. But when it comes to sincerity, it's something that no one can help you with. No human being can help you with it. It's something that's inside you. And you have to work on it with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Making dua to Allah and keeping an eye on yourself. That what am I doing? Why am I doing it? And who am I doing it for? Everything a Muslim does, and Imam Qurtubi rahmatullahi he says this at the end, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يُرَادُ بِهِ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ لَا غَيْرَهُ That true sincerity is gained when a person does every action for the sake of Allah and for no one else. No one else weighs in when it comes to our actions only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything that is done is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the second thing, and I'll talk about sincerity ahead under some of the other sub-discussions, but another discussion or another point that we need to work on with our good character is what we call a sidq being truthful. Now when I say being truthful, what comes to your mind? Come on everyone. Don't lie, right? When I say sincerity, what comes to your mind? Don't lie. Because we've narrowed the definition and meaning of sidq, truthfulness to that. We've narrowed its definition down. And we've locked it inside a small little corner, which means if I don't lie, I'm a truthful person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises great things to truthful people. But in reality, truthfulness isn't only an action of a tongue, it's more than that. There was a very famous scholar by the name of Imam al-Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, may Allah have mercy on him. Imam al-Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says, As-sidq ala aqsam, that there are different types of truthfulness. And the first level of truthfulness, obviously, is being truthful with the tongue. So what this means is that everything you say, you say the truth in. When a person lies, generally, you're trying to hide something. Lying is a result of hiding something, which means you've done something which you shouldn't have been doing or you're shameful because you did it. So the Muslim is one who's so transparent and he does everything for the sake of Allah to even start with, so there's nothing to hide. That if I did something, I'll say it. The companions were you know, at the sword and about to be killed because of their iman, but they didn't lie saying that I don't believe in Allah because they were proud of it. It was their ikhlas. They believed in Allah from the heart. So if, if it requires my neck in return, I'll say I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were truthful at every step. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam discouraged lying. He said that lying will destroy you. Right? It will lead you to the fire of hell. Right? The Prophet sallallahu wa said that lying is corruption, it's bad, it's a sin. And sins will lead you to the fire of hell. Allah azza wa jal says in the Quran, فَنَجَعَ اللَّعَنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's curse is on those who lie. Because when a person lies excessively, you lose the trust of the people around you. You guys have heard the story, right? The, the boy who called? Wolf, right? He lost the trust of the people around him. And when he wanted to say something that was truthful, people wouldn't accept him. The Prophet wasallam, even before prophethood, he was known for being truthful. I'll tell you guys a little experience. Sometimes in life, by speaking the truth, you may have to face immediate consequences. It may be you did something wrong. But you'd rather face those consequences and learn not to lie rather than continuously lying and never learning your lesson in life. Sometimes speaking the truth is the hardest thing. But just say it. People will learn how to value you for who you are. And if you realize at some point that my speaking the truth is harming me a lot, that doesn't mean you stop speaking the truth. In return, what that means is you better yourself. You know, people understand things the wrong way. So if I speak the truth, it's going to harm me. So most people here sitting here would think, what should I do? Stop speaking the truth. I won't get harmed anymore. An example of this is once I was giving a lecture, and I was talking about Islam's standpoint on music. And um, I mentioned my opinion in this matter that I believe, according to the Quran and Sunnah, that music is something that is impermissible. And based off this, 
And let's say, for example, I mean, um, this is not my opinion in any regard, but let's say, for example, someone even does say that music is permissible. The music that we have today, and the stuff that people listen to, you know, the hip-hop, the rap that's out there, it's so terrible, it's so terrible. You know, when I saw, I, I was, the other day, I was, you know, I was just surfing the internet, and I was looking at the, the most famous songs. And the reason I was going through it is to see what's cooking in our youth's heads. And Lady Gaga was on there. And I was thinking, Ya Allah, if this person can take fame and actually become something, a significant part of people's lives, then where is the Ummah going? Who, who's going to be leading us? So at that point, I said to my friends that what's most disrespectful is when you walk inside a car or when you sit in a car, someone says, Sheikh, let me give you a ride. And you sit in their car and um, this happened in reality. I sat in someone's car and then the brother, he was giving me a ride. So when you turn the car on, there was some hip-hop pumping. So he heard me like, oh, shit, turn it off. <laughs> Where is being fearful of Allah gone? Where is that gone? Anyway, so he turned it off right away. And I said to my dear friend, you know, you listen to music, that's your thing. I have nothing to do with that. That's your action. You have to do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment for that. But one thing I will ask you is that if you're going to listen to this stuff, at least for the sake of Allah, in your rear view mirror here, you have Ayatul Kursi hanging. Don't do it in its presence. You have Allah's name there. If you have Allah's name there and you're listening to bad things full of kufr, shirk, and nifaq, and fisq, and you're saying, you're listening to it in the, name, in the presence, in the name of Allah, that's no good. So what does this guy do? He takes it off his rearview mirror. <laughs> I said, no, keep that there. Take these CDs out. You, you caught the wrong end of things. So if you're being truthful is going to harm you, that doesn't mean you stop being truthful. What that means is that you figure out what's harming you in reality. Your actions are harming you. You need to fix things up here. So being truthful, Imam Ghazali Allah, starts with the tongue. If you're truthful with your tongue, the result of this will be that you will gain the confidence of the people around you. The people around you will know when to trust you and when not to trust you. Okay? The second aspect of being truthful, Imam Ghazali Rahmatullah says, is truthfulness of the heart. Where now you're being truthful in your sincerity. You know how I said I was talking about sincerity, I'll wrap it in again. Here's where it comes in again. That truthfulness of the heart is what we call sincerity. Now what's in your heart, so sincerity is where you gain or truthfulness of the heart is where you gain the trust of Allah, and truthfulness of the tongue is where you gain the trust of people. Because you can fool people with your tongue, but if you're lying in your heart, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is viewing this. Allah Azawajal says in the Quran, إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَكَاذِبُونَ That when the hypocrites come to you, they say that you are the messenger of Allah. Is that statement a lie or is it true? It's true, right? The Prophet ﷺ was the messenger of Allah. The hypocrites were saying this. That, إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ You're the messenger of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ Allah knows you're the messenger. But at the same time, Allah calls these hypocrites what? وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَكَاذِبُونَ They're liars. On what base did Allah call them a liar if what they said with their tongue was true? The base was that their tongue was speaking the truth, but in reality their hearts were lying because their hearts were empty of faith in Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So being truthful in your heart, that when you say something, when, you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when something comes into your heart, you do it only and only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third degree of speaking truth, right, being truthful, Imam Ghazali alayhi says, is truthfulness in one's actions. And this is the combination. So you're being truthful with your tongue, you're gaining the trust of people. You're being truthful with your heart, you're, being tr you're, being, you're gaining the trust of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you're truthful in your actions, truthfulness in the action means that your tongue and your heart are in sync, which in return give you a truthful action. You guys understand? So you make a promise to someone, your heart knows that you're making this promise for the sake of Allah, you fulfill that promise through your actions. So this is the highest level of being truthful. That you are truthful in your actions because you are truthful in your tongue and also with your heart. Okay? So this is something that we should all be working on. And when a person is truthful in their actions, that means that they have the trust of both people. That what they're doing, they mean it you know, as pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also for the betterment of people. <clears throat> the next thing that we should work on in terms of our good character is to, love, to, 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 to look forward and learn to love one another. This is a sunnah of the Prophet wasallam to love other people. To love other people for who they are and for the sake of Allah, not for your personal interest. The people that we love, the people that we associate with, a lot of the times it's because we have a personal interest. We know this brother, mashallah, is from a wealthy family and he'll take the tab every time we go to Giordano's. So why not be friends with him? 
Okay? This guy's a wealthy guy. He'll take me wherever he goes and I'll benefit from his fruits. So why not stay with this guy? We learn to love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-hubbu fi Allah wa al-baghdu fi Allah. Inna ahab al-a'mal ila Allah ta'ala. Al-hubbu fi Allah wa al-baghdu fi Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Indeed, the most valuable deed, the most beloved deed to Allah is loving for the sake of Allah and also hating people for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Loving people for the sake of Allah. That you love someone and your love is based off the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what advice my teacher would give to a bride and groom who were getting married. He would say to them, that don't love one another for each other's sake. Because if something happens, then that love may diminish. It could fall. But if you love each other for the sake of Allah, in Allah, hayyun la yazal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alive and He will always remain and your love will, also, or your, your love will always remain. Learn to love people for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in a hadith as narrated by Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi in his al al mufrad He narrates from Abu Hurairah radiallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one day in a gathering he was sitting and he said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَذِي I take an oath by the one in whose hands my soul lies that you can never be a complete believer, you can never enter into Jannah until you are a believer. He said, you can never enter into Jannah until you are a believer. And he said, and you cannot be a complete believer until you learn how to love one another. Learn how to love one another. Learn how to be kind. Our hearts are full of hatred. We're full of suspicion. We're always thinking that this is the Palestinian group, that's the Indian Pakistani group. I wonder what those guys are talking about us. And every time the Pakistani guys walk past, they, they kind of raise their eyebrow. I wonder those, what those Arabs are saying about us. Why is, there, why is there division? I don't understand. The reality is that you're both Muslims and you love each other for the sake of Allah. Come to that agreement. Why are we talking about our disagreements? What, 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 is color ma- what does color matter? You know, in the masjid of the Prophet wasallam, they were companions from different backgrounds. And some of them were rivals. Their backgrounds were rivals. For example, um, Suhaib Rumi radiallahu an. Suhaib radiallahu an is from Rome. He was from the Roman Empire. He was a Roman. And Salman radiallahu an was? He was Persian. And the Roman and Persians, what were they known for? They hated each other. Right? It was like your Liverpool and Manchester United. They hated each other. Right? The Green Bay, Green Bay Packers and the Bears. These guys hated each other. And so here you have the Romans and the Persians, they hated each other. But you never hear a story that Salman and Suhaib radiallahu are walking in the store and walking in the market and Suhaib radiallahu tripped him over and said, I got you. Because the, the, you know, when they stood in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, sal- in salah, they were one. You know, the Urdu poet he says. Right? Eki saf me kare huwe Mahmudu ayaz na koi raha banda na koi banda nawaz. That when they stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the slave and the master stand in one line. Mahmud was the king, Mahmud, Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi. And his slave was name was Ayaz. He says, Eki saf me kare huwe Mahmudu ayaz. That now when it's salah time, the slave and the master stand in the same line. Na koi raha banda na koi banda nawaz. And when they're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on one line, there's no longer a distinguish between the king and the, and, and the slave. Now they're one, now they're equal. Learn to love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is narrated by Imam Ahmad rahmatullahi alayhi in his musnad. He narrates from uh, Ma'adi Karab radiallahu ta'ala that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that when you love someone, you should let them know that you love them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you inform people that you love them, in return they will also have that same love back for you. The Habu, the Prophet ﷺ said, learn to love one another. And this was a characteristic that companions had. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Quran, in Surah Fatah, that um, Muhammad Rasulullah wa Ladina Ma'ahu Ashiddahu al Kufar, Ruhama Ubainahum. That the companions were those who loved one another. They loved one another very dearly. This is one of their this is one of their characteristics. The companions had great love for one another. Oh, Ibn Umar radiallahu an, the son of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an, he was given the head of a goat, right? And he was going to cook this and feed it to his family. But then he thought to himself that if I eat this and my neighbor next to me is hungry, how bad is that going to be? Right? The Prophet ﷺ said, that person is not, not a believer. The Prophet ﷺ said, that person is not a believer. Who eats to his full. He's, he's ate, he had a nice big meal. And on his side, his neighbor is hungry there. So he thought to himself that it's my right that I give it to my neighbor. So he told his family, we're going to have to be hungry for another night. Let me give it to my neighbor. So he gave it to his neighbor. His neighbor, before he ate it, he thought to himself, what if my neighbor's hungry? And Ibn Umar radiallahu an says, that goat's head went to seven neighbors before the last person thought, let me give it back to Ibn Umar because maybe he's hungry. It went through seven houses and came back to his house because each person cared for the other person as much. You know, you find the hadith that during the battle of Uhud, 
there was a companion who was fighting, and while he was fighting, you know, the battle of Uhud took a flip. The companions were winning, then all of a sudden they went on the lower side. They were suffering a defeat from the kuffar. So one of the, one of the relatives who was in the battlefield, he wasn't able to fight, he was serving water to people. So he thought to himself, let me take some water to my relative who was a fighter. So he began to search for him, and he found him in the battlefield. He was going to give him water. And his relative said to him, that before you give me water, you know, he was injured on the ground, about to die himself. And he says, before you give it to me, there's another man somewhere over there. I'm not sure who he is, but I can hear him moaning. He's on the ground, he's injured, go give it to him. So he's about to die, he's thirsty, and he's, he doesn't even know who that guy is. But he's saying he's injured, maybe he's another person, go give it to him. So this person says, okay, he went to that person. And that man said, you know, I, I'm thirsty. He was on the verge of dying as well. He said, but there's another man over there, I can hear him moaning, go give it to him. So the Sahabi went to the last person, when he got to that last person, he was dead. He came back to the second person, he was dead. He came back to his cousin, he was dead. They cared for one another at the time of death. They're facing death right here, yet their love for one another was such. Right? Allah, and, and when it comes to loving one another, to have love for other people, unconditional love for the sake of Allah for other people, is one of the greatest characteristics you can develop inside you. It's one of the best things. And not only loving, you know, whenever we talk about loving one another, automatically, especially the Muslims in the gathering, we assume that we're talking about one Muslim loving a, another Muslim. That's what we assume. But in reality, the love of the Prophet ﷺ was not restricted or limited to Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ's love was general. It was for everyone. That's why the Prophet ﷺ made dua for people in his tahajjud salah, those who hadn't even accepted Islam. He would make dua for them. And he would, he would make lengthy, lengthy, long, long dua for them. That, oh Allah, oh Allah. And he would continue to cry and make dua for them. So this isn't restricted to only making dua, for, I mean, only loving Muslims. It's about loving mankind, learning everyone, loving everyone around you. And this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the best things that you can have, learning to love other people unconditionally for the sake of Allah. That's why we should make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, give us the love of other people. Give us the ability to love other people. There's one scholar, actually he's not a scholar, but a very active person in the field of da'wah uh, in England. He's known as Hafiz Patel. He's a known, renowned person, very active in the field of da'wah. One of my good friends um, from Chicago, Mufti Adi Muddin, he told me this story. He said once, I was, uh, I was with this Hafiz Patel, and I was assigned the duty to, you know, stay in his khidmah during the night because he is an old, he's an old man. So he said, I was there and I was watching after this Hafiz Patel. And I was, I was told by the shaykh to wake him up for, for the hajjud salah. The shaykh said to him, in two, three hours, wake me up for the hajjud salah. So Mufti Adi Muddin said, I was sitting there and I was waiting for the shaykh to fall asleep and waiting for two o'clock to come so I can wake him up. And while I was sitting there, I fell asleep. He said, I woke up and then I saw it was four o'clock. I was two hours late. He said, I was shivering that, man, I was supposed to wake the guy up two hours ago, what happened? So he said, I got up from my bed, I ran there, and his bed was empty. Great, someone kidnapped him. <laughs> so he started searching for him, and he said, when I was searching for him, I found him in the corner of the room, very quietly, sitting on the musalla, and he was making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He already woke up. Whether someone was going to wake him up or not, he was already awake. So he thought to himself, man, this guy's already here making dua. So he said, I went really close to him, and I was trying to listen to what dua was he making. And this old man was crying his eyes out. He was making dua to Allah. And he said, I put my ear close to him. And the only dua that he made, and I sat there for a long time, and he repeated the same dua all night. And what was dua? Oh Allah, have mercy on the ummah. And he woke up for the Hajjah Salah, didn't make a single dua for himself. And all dua he's making is, Oh Allah, have mercy on people. Oh Allah, oh Allah, help the people. Oh Allah, help the people. Oh Allah, help the people. The people are in tough times or not. Help them. We've never even made dua for that person. Many of us didn't even know he existed. Yet a person like that is sitting there and he cares for us. Right? This was a unique sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, to have a painful heart for the people, to learn to love other people. The Prophet ﷺ, sorry, Imam, um, Imam Bukhari in his, in his Aladab al-Mufrad, he narrates from, uh, from, from, from a companion of the Prophet ﷺ, who said that when the companions would sit together, we would ask one another, that what will be the first thing that will leave us before the Day of Judgment? And then the companions would say, the first thing that will leave the ummah before the Day of Judgment is learning to love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One more narration I want to narrate in this regard, then we'll move forward in our, in our discussion, inshallah. This hadith is narrated by, Imam, um, by, by, in, by, by Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh, and it is narrated in Kanzul Umad. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that when someone pleases another Muslim, when, another, when, when someone pleases another person, when he makes another person happy, he has made me happy inside my grave. And when someone makes me happy in my grave, 
he will find me happy with him on the day of judgment. Such a beautiful hadith. It teaches us a purpose, it gives us a goal in life. That rather than living for ourselves, learn how to live for other people. Learn how to care for other people. Because this was something the Prophet ﷺ taught us. Another aspect of loving and caring for other people, which is also, you can say, another sub-discussion under good character, is to care for orphans and to care for widows. Divorcees and widows, and also to care for orphans. How many people sitting here in this room have actually considered adopting an orphan child? Okay, a few people raising their hands. May Allah allow us all to do so. Inshallah, say inshallah. We will be rewarded on our intentions. You know, when I studied in Madrasa, I studied in different countries. And many times the people sitting next to me in class were orphans. When I would look at them, it was very painful. Small things would really get to them. I remember you know, in the Madrasa they had a payphone box and the students used to line up there to call their parents because in those days cell phones weren't common. So we'd line up and wait for our turn and then call. And these guys, whenever a few of my friends, whenever they would walk past that payphone box, they would start crying. I would say, why are you crying? So he would say, these guys are standing in line to call their parents. I don't have anyone to call. Amazing. Look at their hearts. Just today, a sister came and asked me a question. Just today morning, today morning, after Fajr Salah, I received this question. That Sheikh, I was, I, I'm an orphan, and I, I was adopted... You know, I was taken into the foster home and then I went from house to house. And when I was, I think she was, when she was 12 or 13 maybe, she was taken into a, a non-Muslim home. And she said, my non-Muslim parents did not approve of me praying salah and fasting. So she said that I reached the age of maturity at that time. And today, alhamdulillah, finally I've been moved over to a Muslim house. You know, do I have to make qada of that salah and make qada of that fast? Look at her concern. She wants to fast, but people aren't allowing her to fast. It's a responsibility of Muslims that we care for orphans. That we actually feel their pain. The Prophet ﷺ was going for Eid Salah. And while he was going for Eid Salah, he was dressed and all the companions were dressed and they had their itar on, their best clothing on. You know how we go for Eid Salah? And the Prophet ﷺ, while he was going, he saw on the roadside there was a young child sitting there and he was crying. The Prophet ﷺ told the companions, go ahead, I'll catch up with you. He came to this young child, he said, why are you crying? He said, O Messenger of Allah, all the children are holding their parents' hands and they're going for Eid Salah and I don't have a father to hold my hand because my father passed away in the battle. The Prophet ﷺ took this child and he carried him on his shoulder. And he was reading the takbir on the way to Eid Salah. You know, the takbir reading, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha. He was reading the takbir on the way there. And when the Prophet ﷺ finally came in front of the grand gathering of Eid, he didn't tell the child, sit down, I'll catch you after Eid Salah. He took that child to the front of the gathering and while he gave the khutbah, that child sat in the lap of the Prophet ﷺ. And then the Prophet ﷺ, after Eid Salah said to him, that from today onwards you will never say that you don't have parents, for Muhammad is your father and Aisha is your mother. Caring for other people. The Prophet ﷺ, he says as narrated by Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi in his sahih, and also he narrates from Sahal bin Sa'ad radiallahu anh, that the Prophet ﷺ said, I and the person who cares and loves and takes care of an orphan will be like this on the Day of Judgment. Because the Prophet ﷺ himself was an orphan. And he knew what it felt like growing up as an orphan. And that feeling the Prophet ﷺ had in his heart was something that he expressed in this hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari. Where the Prophet ﷺ says that the one who takes care of an orphan, him and I will be like this on the Day of Judgment. That's why our teachers used to tell us that make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts you for this. It's a very big, it's a very big step. It's a very big thing. Ibn Umar radiallahu before we go to Ibn Umar's narration, another narration I'm going to narrate by Anas radiallahu an, narrated in Kanzul Amal. He narrates from Anas radiallahu an, that Anas radiallahu an says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the, 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 the food table that has barakah in there is one that has an orphan sitting on it. If you don't have an orphan sitting on your table, then the barakah is there, but it's not where it should be. As long as that orphan is missing, you're missing your barakah. That's why it's, it's said regarding Ibn Umar radiallahu an, the son of Umar bin Khattab, that Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu an would only have a meal if there was an orphan sitting on his table. If there wasn't an orphan there, he'd skip the, he'd skip the meal, go find an orphan, come back, and then he would eat. People who cared for orphans. You know, and this is something we should make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts us for. When we graduated from England in Madrasa, actually before me, a few classes ahead of me, there were a group of students who graduated, and when they graduated from the Adam course, they sat together and they said that there are certain things in the country that need to change. 
So we, today, there was like 40, 50 of them. They said, we need to split up into groups and work together as a team. And each team of us should work towards a particular thing that needs to be done in the community. So one group of them said, okay, there's a lot of corruption in the meat market. So we will specialize in delivering people halal meat. So they started an organization for that. There was another group of people, they said, you know what? There are many reliefs out there. But a lot of the reliefs, fortunately and unfortunately, they take some of them, uh, I mean, it's haram, I would say very clearly, they take a significant amount of your donation for the sake of their administration costs. So the person who's working for a quote-unquote non-for-profit organization as an executive is ha has a six-figure salary coming in his pocket. And where is he getting that money from? He's getting that money from a high percentage that's being taken from the wealth that people are giving as sadaqah. You know, I'm giving it for an orphan and that money is being given to another person's paycheck, which is halal for that person to, 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 to earn. I'm not saying it's not halal, but sometimes it's abused. Organizations, sometimes they abuse this privilege of theirs. So these people said, you know what? We're going to change this. We will create a relief organization that will be 100% every dollar, every penny that you give will go to the poor. And this is the only relief that I know alive on the face of this earth right now. Sheikh Hatim, he said this from England, he said this. He said, the only relief organization that I know on the face of this earth that gives 100% um, of their proceeds to donation is this organization. And these scholars just said, we're going to do it. And how we're going to feed ourselves, we'll figure out another way. And they created this model of establishing small relief stores throughout the country. And the income of that they gave to their administration. But all the money that was given to them for donation, they took care of it there. The third group of guys, they said, you know what, what we're going to do. And these are all my friends, by the way. I know, these all, I know all these people firsthand, good friends of mine. The third group of them, they, they said, you know what, we have so many orphans or so many kids who are being taken away from their parents because of social issues. And these children don't have a place to go and they don't have an environment to grow up in an Islamic environment. So what we will do is that we will ensure that Muslim orphans are delivered to Muslim households. And they dedicated their life for this. All of them. And subhanAllah, you know, I had the chance to visit their office once and I was sitting there and these kids and these parents were all in tears in front of them. That these people had done something that we Muslims in America also have to think of to do one day. Inshallah, and Aziz. Okay? So caring for orphans. And as far as it goes, caring for widows and caring for divorcees, the Prophet ﷺ says, the one who serves the widow it is as if he is doing jihad in the pathway of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith is narrated by the hadith is narrated by Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi in his sahih. An extension to this, along with being kind to the orphans and the widows, an aspect of good character is also loving and honoring the elderly people in the community. When we're young, we disrespect our elders. Because we think they're crazy, we think they're too demanding, we think they're you know they're a good laughing stock for us. But we don't realize that one day we will also become old. And in Arabic, there's a very famous proverb. They say, Man dhahika dhahika. That whoever laughs today, someone's going to laugh on you tomorrow. If you laugh today at someone, tomorrow someone's going to come and laugh at you. And the Prophet wasallam, he spent a significant amount of his time on a daily basis sitting with the elderly people. You know how we sit with our friends, we like chilling with them. But if there are elderly people there, we don't like sitting with them, we don't like serving them. You know, leave them alone, I'll take care of myself. I'll chill with my friends. The Prophet wasallam, would take out a time every day to go and serve the elderly. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, during his khilafah every morning he used to go to a blind lady and living in the outskirts of Medina Manawara and would clean her house and deliver water to her house. This is Amir al-Mu'mineen Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, right? The, the, the khalifa of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The person who, you know, in front of him the Roman and Persians were nothing. And he's serving an old lady outside Medina Manawara cleaning her house every day at the hajjah time and serving water to her. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says in the hadith, they say, Minna man lam ya'rif sharfa kabirana. The one who does not, in the hadith is narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu says, the one who does not honor his elders isn't even from us. Walam yarham sagirana. The one who doesn't love his and have mercy on his young ones, even that person isn't from us. So learning how to honor the elder, elderly and having mercy on the, ones young, uh, on the ones younger than us. And this is another thing, especially when we reach this age of our 20s, um, for the brothers in particular, we start making, we start mocking kids. And we're too harsh and too mean to them. Some of our cousins, maybe someone, if we're in our 20s, someone who's 15, 16 years old, rather than giving them an ear, because whether you know it or not, if you're older than, you know, if you're the older one in the house, or if you're the older one in the group of friends, you know, remind yourself when you were younger. When we were younger, we used to look up to those who were older than us. When I was 16 years old, the people who were 18 years old were the coolest people on the face of the earth. When I was 11 years old, if I had the chance to go for a dinner with those group of friends who were 17 years old, that was Eid for me. I felt so happy. I tell everyone, you know guys, I went to dinner with those guys the other day. Because it's just something that you feel, you aspire to be like them. You aspire to grow up one day and have you know, the coolness that they have. 
So today when you're at that age, you have to keep in mind that maybe rather than ignoring the young ones and making jokes on them and always continuously bashing, this is a disease of the heart. Some people have this issue. They continuously bash. They find someone who's vulnerable and someone that, can, that you can make a joke out of and they'll make one joke on them, we'll make a second joke on them, a third joke, and they'll continuously, continuously joke on that person until that person from inside is torn up. And finally when that person flips, we say, oh, he can't take a joke. He can't take a joke. Learn to know where your tongue is. The Prophet ﷺ said, this tongue is what's going to lead you to the fire of hell. Know that this tongue is going to lead you into the fire of hell. So having mercy on our young ones. If the, if the people who are in their 20s here, if we actually took time to just sit down and listen to the teenagers of our community, I'm talking about 16 under the high school and the middle school kids, we can cause a change within society. Because what an imam has to say to a young middle school kid or a high school kid really has only so much weight. But what you guys being their role models, alhamdulillah, what you guys have to say to them, it means so much more. We need to recycle our abilities one generation to the next, next generation to the next. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to do so. Okay, there's two, three more things I want to cover and then I'll be done inshallah. Um, hiding the faults of other people. This is also from good character. The hadith is narrated by Imam Abu Dawud rahmatullahi alayhi. He narrates from Abu Hurairah radiallahu an, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, whoever hides the fault of another person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hide that person's faults on the day of judgment. Man ra'a awratan fasataraha, satara Allahu anhu yawm al-qiyamah. Whoever sees the fault of a person and he hides it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hide his faults on the day of judgment. You know, how many things have we done on this road that we definitely don't want other people to see on the day of judgment? The easiest way is to hide the faults of other people rather than always chattering and talking and waiting for someone to make a mistake and slip and then throwing it right up on Facebook and Twitter and, or sending a mass text to all the people that, you know what, you know, he went to Jarnana's, you ordered food and then he didn't have a credit card in his pocket to pay for it. LOL. And making a joke out of that person. We're always waiting for people to slip and want to make fun of them and make jokes out of them. And, 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 and an extension to this, okay, that, that could be viewed as a, on a level of humor. I'm sure we could take it that way. But sometimes it's serious. Sometimes it's a serious thing. For example, there's a husband and wife that are going through marital issues. Now, we come to know of it, that their marriage isn't working on. So what should we do? What are we supposed to do? Hide it. Make dua to Allah. You know, maybe go to them and say, brother, can I help you? Let me know. Sister, can I help you? Let me know. What we end up doing is talking about it. We tell everyone in the community. The women in the community, the men in the community, it becomes a chatter. Oh, their marriage is breaking up. Oh, this is happening, that's happening. Maybe it was his fault, maybe it was her fault. And we get into their discussion when it's nothing to do with us. The Prophet wasallam said, your iman, your faith is when you leave those things that don't concern you. Things that don't concern you, leave them. Things that have nothing to do with you, leave them. Hide the faults of other people. The Prophet wasallam said, said one hadith sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, مَنْ رَآ عَوْرَةً فَسَطَرَهَا كَانَ كَمَنْ أَحْيَا مَوْدَةً that whoever sees the fault of another person and he hides it, it is as if he has brought back to life a girl who was buried alive. The girl who was buried alive, it's as if he brought her back to life. Meaning, it's such a great thing that this person has done. And the Prophet ﷺ says in one hadith, as narrated by, again, Imam, um, Imam Abu Dawud, عليه, he narrates from Abu, Bazar, Abu, Abu Barza, عن, that the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever exposes the faults of people in this world, if this is something you love doing, talking about other people's bad and not looking at yourself. Whoever exposes the faults of other people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose that person in front of all of creation on the Day of Judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from doing so. The second and last thing that I wanted to discuss as a part of good character and the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is to learn to control one's anger. Anger is very dangerous. And it's so bad that it covers, it smokes off your intellect and it makes you do things that you, ne- you in reality don't want to do. Learn how to control your anger. This is where a person's strength actually lies. The Prophet says in the hadith, لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِسُرْعَةً The strong person isn't the one who can slam the other guy down in front of him. So we establish our strength by arm wrestling. We establish our strength by fighting one another, wrestling and physically taking each other down and who can give a harder tackle in a football game. The Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّمَا الشَّدِيدُ الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ الْغَدَرِ The true powerful one is the one who controls himself when he is angry. Control yourself when you're angry. Learn how to control that anger. If you can control your anger, trust me, you know, your life before, after marriage will be amazing. You know, people come and they ask me, brothers and sisters, Sheikh, I'm interested in marrying so-and-so, what's your advice? I always tell them, just ask the people around and make sure that person doesn't have an anger issue. 
Because if there's an anger issue involved, things are going to go south very, very soon, and there are going to be a lot of problems. Most of the issues that I deal with as an imam, most of the issues that I deal with as an imam, marriage issues I'm talking about here. Marriages break up, got into a fight, what happened? Why did you say divorce? I was angry. I was angry. I was angry. Why don't you want to live with your husband? He has anger issues. Why don't, want to live, why don't you want to live with your wife? She has anger issues. Just on the way here, on the way to UIC right now, I got a phone call. And the couple were telling me that we want a divorce. I said, why? Because whenever we get angry, one person decides to start throwing stuff on the other person. And laptops, and plates, and this, and that. And if you're raising your eyebrows and thinking, what a fool, if you don't have control over your anger, then make dua to Allah tomorrow, your phone call doesn't go to an imam. Learn how to control your anger. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, the companion came, he said, the Messenger of Allah, give me advice. And the Prophet ﷺ, what was his advice to him? لا تغضب. He said, the Messenger of Allah, give me more advice. And what did the Prophet ﷺ say to him then? لا تغضب. He said, the Messenger of Allah, give me something unique, give me some good advice. And what did the Prophet ﷺ say to him again? Same thing, he said, لا تغضب. And what does لا تغضب mean? Do not become angry. Control your anger. Do not be a mad person. The companions learned from the Prophet ﷺ how to control their anger. The Prophet ﷺ says in the hadith, as narrated by Imam Abu Dawood and Imam Tirmidhi that the one who becomes angry and he has the ability to fulfill his anger. The one who becomes angry and has the ability to fulfill his anger. What does that mean? What this means is that, let's say for example, you are an adult and there's someone young in front of you. And a young person did something to you and they made you angry. And you have the ability to fulfill it because you're physically stronger. And you decide to hit that person or you decide not to hit that person. This is what it means. You know, those people who, those men in our community who get a kick out of, um, who get a kick out of abusing their wives. The reason why they do it is because they're angry and physically, possibly they have the ability to exercise that anger. They possibly have the, have the ability to go ahead and beat the person up or do something with them. This is, this is another common thing, right? Men not having control over themselves and then decide to go after the women and beat them up. My teacher used to say to them that if you're that, if, you're, if you really don't have control over your anger, one thing is not having control over your anger. The other thing is having control over your anger, but not doing it because it's the, it's the easier way out and then abusing the person in front of you. My teacher used to say that if you really don't have control over your anger and anytime anyone ticks you off, you hit them, then why don't you go and hit the cop next time he pulls you over and gives you a ticket? Because when he pulls you over, aren't you mad? Yes, no? You're thinking of a hundred ways to justify you're so angry, you're frustrated, but could you touch that guy? Touch him. If you're really that tough, touch him. Let's see what happens then. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last khutbah the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave in Arafah, when he gave that khutbah, what did he say? He said, men, be careful of your women. Not be careful in that sense. Ittaqu, which means that, you know, be, be careful in taking care of them. There you go. Okay? Be care- <laughs> Someone could, you know, snip this out and I could be defamed for saying that. Okay. Be careful of women. What does that mean? That be kind and be careful in taking care of them. Don't abuse them. Don't oppress them. And also, this was one of the last advices the Prophet ﷺ gave before he, he ﷺ passed away. So the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever has the ability to execute his anger, yet he doesn't do so. The Prophet ﷺ says, he will be called on the Day of Judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to that person, choose from these things whatever you want. Whatever you want from here, you choose it. You call it, it's yours. Because you controlled your anger in the world. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to do so. And the last point of discussion, which is actually one of the most important, we saved it for the end, is good character lies in modesty. The Prophet ﷺ was extremely modest. Aisha radiallahu anha, when she describes the modesty of the Prophet ﷺ, she says, his modesty was like that of a newlywed bride on the first night of her marriage. You know, when the bride is newly married, and on the first night of her marriage, extremely modest, even reluctant to speak, reluctant to make any contact initially. The same way, the Prophet ﷺ was very, very modest. He was very calm, very modest. He had his gaze lowered, spoke in a humble way, dressed in a humble way. He interacted with people in a humble way. Modesty, as the Prophet ﷺ says, الْحَيَاءُ مِنَ iman. That modesty is your faith. It's a part of your faith. And the Prophet ﷺ, one companion, he came, he said, Messenger of Allah, I have a brother who's over the top modest. OTT, over the top modest. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, الْحَيَاءُ كُلَّهُ خَيْرٍ There's no such thing. There's no OTT with modesty. Everything about al hayau kullahu khair. Every single thing about modesty is good. There is no such thing as overdoing it or underdoing it. And this is a very important thing for those of you sitting in front of me right now. 
Because you're in college right now. And this is the age that is yelling at you. It's shouting at you. Please be immodest. This is the time. Come tomorrow to school in a tank top and trust me, you will turn the heads. Right? And if you won't turn heads, hit the gym and then do it. You'll turn heads. Okay? So immodesty is shouting at you. Rather than being the quiet one in the gathering, why don't you raise your voice a little? And rather than laughing, ha, 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 make it a capital, ha, ha, ha. And people will look at you. You'll be cool. Be immodest. Because modesty isn't only in clothing. It's in speech and actions as well. Modesty is in one person's clothing. It's in speech. And it's also in actions. Learning how to be modest. Within the genders and between the genders. Within your own gender, be modest. And between the genders, also be modest. So dress properly. Especially if you're roommates and you're dorming somewhere. You know, with roommates, you become immodest for some random reason. People start speaking very foully. They're walking around unclothed properly. Learn how to be modest within your gender. Be a modest person. Be a good person. It's said regarding the Prophet wasallam that his satar, right, his private area between his navel and knees was never exposed in front of anyone other than his family throughout his entire life except for in one scenario. That when the Kaaba was being built, when the Prophet wasallam was young, his uncle Abbas an said to him, that why don't you lift your lower garment a little higher? That way it'll be easier to work. And the Prophet wasallam considered doing it. He lifted it a little bit and he fainted. And then when he woke up, they asked him what happened. So he said that an angel was standing in front of him and he said, lower your garment. And that was the last time. He was a young child then. Modesty of the Prophet ﷺ. And with guys in particular, and also with women, our clothing, well, I don't know what happened to the modesty. Our clothing is so terrible. Guys are wearing tight shirts. Guys are wearing tight shirts. When did this happen? Okay? And they're not supposed to be wearing it. I saw one brother who was studying the deen. Right? He's studying the deen and he was wearing a skin tight shirt with a necklace around his neck and a bracelet around his, uh, around, his, around his wrist right here and his ears pierced. I said, brother, what are you doing? That necklace and bracelet and piercing belongs to the women. And these clothing belong to your children. <laughs> you shouldn't be wearing either of them. You should be dressed modestly. Why, what are you trying to do? What, why are you exposing yourself? Why don't you wear something that actually allows you to breathe and you know, something that's a little bit more comfortable, a little loose on you. And yes, I am marketing my clothing. <laughs> <laughs> and the same thing for the sisters, dressing modestly. Making sure that you're doing what you're dressing. Why are you dressing? Who are you dressing to please? What's your purpose? Why are you wearing this garment? Is it for yourself? Is it for other people? And then between the genders as well. Making sure that when there is a need, you know, if someone asks me, is it permissible for the genders to interact? I say very clearly, it is permissible with the condition of modesty and necessity. If there is a need, interact. But with the condition of modesty and necessity. That you, you interact when it's, needed, when, it's, when it's needed and remain modest throughout your interaction. What happens a lot of times is some of us, we use Islam as our reason to interact with one another. We say, this is a shura meeting. <laughs> and shura means I am above the sharia. Okay? So what that means is that I will interact with anyone that I need to, whether private or openly, and you can't say anything about it. Well, that's your decision to do so. At the end of the day, no one's here as your halal haram police. We're not going to force you into doing anything. But it's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be modest. Because modesty shines. Trust me, people who, who have this habit of flirting and always putting themselves out in front of others, you know, initially maybe it's a little amusing, but at some point, the rest of the people around them begin to get bored of them. Come on, please, put yourself together. Right? Be a person. Be, be who you're supposed to be. And modesty, it shines. It shines so greatly that the world around you will turn their head towards you because you're modest. The world will die to be with you because you're modest. Be modest. Be kind. Be careful when you interact with one another. Okay? You know, especially when you're on campus, you don't have no ulama or mashayikh or imams to guide you. So it's kind of you on your own. But remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. And sometimes it's these lecture series that where you hear what needs to be done and then you do it the right way. And I, I, I speak very openly, whether you're on shura or not, keep in mind, that the most important thing, and we started off with this and I'm going to end with this, is your sincerity, your ikhlas. If you're doing something for the sake of Allah, you'll be rewarded for it. But if you claim you're serving people, but you're doing it against the will of Allah, then that's not sincerity. That's not sincerity in your action, neither is it sincerity in your heart. You have to be sincere on all levels. The Prophet says in the hadith, as is narrated by Imam Muslim, the first three people to be thrown in the fire of hell, the one who gave charity, the one who fought in the path of Allah, and the scholar. You would think these are the first three people to go to paradise. The companions asked, O Messenger of Allah, why them? The Prophet ﷺ will say, he said that the martyr, because 
he died seeking the pleasure of people, not the pleasure of Allah. And the one who gave charity, he was giving charity to please other people, not please Allah. And the scholar who was serving the deen, the one who was working in the, you know, within the university thinking that he was trying to serve Allah and please Allah, and that's what he kept saying to everyone whenever he went to this meeting, or whenever he went to this gathering, or whenever he was setting up an event. He wasn't doing it to please Allah, he was doing it for another reason. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from this inshallah and aziz. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adorn us all with good character. May Allah azza wa jalla allow us all truly love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the way he deserves to be loved. And may Allah azza wa jalla grant us all the ability to study the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in detail so we can implement it into our lives and teach the world around us the beautiful Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, and astaghfiruka natubu ilayk akhru da'wana. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala. وبركاته